Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to this um, final session for today. Um, I'm going to talk about cryptography. My name is Michel Schudel. I'm a Java developer for a software company called Craftsman in the Netherlands. Yes, there they are. Um, and uh, we are all over the country with uh, Dutch IRS, uh, Dutch Railways, uh, Rabobank, where I'm working right now. And okay, so today I'm going to tell you something about cryptography. So I was. Why doesn't it work? Oh boy. Oh, it's. Yeah. Um, I was really interested. You know, uh, two years ago I was really into cryptography and crypto coins and stuff like that. And um, so, do you guys have any crypto coins left still? There's one, a few. So, did it make you filthy rich like it did me? Okay, well, I didn't get any money from it, but it was really interesting because um, I went to this crypto exchange and I had to log in using HTTPS and then I did some transactions and um, I thought, how did you do all this stuff? So also Bitcoin mining, stuff like that. So there's a lot of cryptography under this and I was really interested in how this actually works and also for a big bank in the Netherlands I had to build a crypto toolbox so I had to learn all this stuff. Now, this is not something you encounter every day because normally security and cryptography is you know, abstracted away in your framework or uh, hidden in the transport layer but it's good when something goes wrong that you know a little bit about how this stuff works. So, what I'm going to do today is teach you um, a basic understanding of cryptographic concepts and how they're done in Java. Okay, so that's my goal for today. I hope you will learn some from it. Um, please refrain from asking any questions until the very end because I've got a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, or during beers, that's also fine by me, okay? So, um, a definition. Cryptography is basically the practice and study of hiding information. That's all it is, and it's been around for a long time as well. So, anyone knows what this artifact is on the right side photo? Yeah, Rosetta Stone, actually. Uh, excellent. Uh, so, on the Rosetta Stone, there is ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, there's also something called demotic, I don't know actually what it is, and, but also ancient Greek, and we could read ancient Greek, so this helped us to actually translate these hieroglyphics. So that's cool. The Romans used this as well. They used a simple substitution cipher, you know, so A becomes C, B becomes D, etc., etc. And the cipher itself was different for every platoon or part of the army or location. So, for example, um, uh, a platoon in the south of Italy had a different substitution cipher than a platoon in the north of Italy. So that's, yeah, that's pretty cool. And you might not have expected this one. So this is Kama Sutra. And uh, in the Kama Sutra, there's actually a whole chapter on using cryptographic functions and messages as a, as a meaning of communication between lovers. So, if you still think cryptography isn't sexy, this is the counterproof, okay? Um, and also this one, of course, this is the... Yeah, this is the Enigma machine, right. So, used by the Germans in the Second World War, cracked by Aaron Turing, Aaron, Alan Turing and his team, and it has been said to have shortened the war by uh, probably two or three years. So that's a little history for you. So if you look at modern cryptography, what does it try to solve? Well, the first part is confidentiality. So that means not knowing what the message entails. Second part is integrity. So that means you are absolutely sure the message has not been tampered with. And the third part is authenticity. So you know who actually sent the message and you're 100% sure that that is the person who sent the message. So cryptography tries to solve these three parts and we're going to look at that in greater detail. So um, what does contemporary or modern cryptography look like? Well, it basically consists of three parts. So the first part is semantic encryption, where Bob sends a message to Alice and he uses a key to encrypt the message. And Alice uses the same key to de decrypt the message. That's semantic encryption. The other one is, of course, asymmetric encryption, where you have a key pair, two different keys, and you can, uh, Bob can use the public key to encrypt a message, and um, Alice can use her private key to decrypt a message. So this is done because uh, anyone can send Alice a message that only she can decipher, 
um, we'll see for digital signatures is just the other way around, but that has a reason. And the third part is hashing. Well, you're probably familiar with this, right? So we're going to look a little bit into that. But first, how this is done in Java. So Java has two API sets. Uh, one is the JCE, Java Cryptography Architecture, and the other one is the Java Cryptography Extension. So the original idea was that um, the JCA was the API layer, and uh, the JCE was basically the implementation of it. But nowadays, you know, they're kind of a mixed bag, so normally you use them two together. So the JCE contains something more about semantic encryption and JCA about asymmetric encryption. So the architecture looks like this. If you have a Java application using cryptographic functions, you send a request to the API. And the API will delegate this request to a cryptographic service provider. So this is basically an implementation of that service provider. So if you use the JDK, there is al already one provider in there. It's called SunGC. You can just use it out of the box. But if you want to do some uh, extra um, um, advanced encryption stuff, you can use BouncyCast, for example, which is a Maven Central. But you can also use hardware providers, for example, uh, Digiware is one. Uh, so you can plug in any cryptographic service provider you want. So how do you do that? Well, one way is this. There is a security class in Java, and you can just use the method add provider with a new specific provider that has to implement the, I, know, I think it's an abstract class, but it might be an interface, I don't know, uh, Java security provider. Or you can register it in the Java security file, which basically means that you have a small property file where you can just add a line and register a security, uh, a security provider there. Now, in Java 8 and previous, um, it was a little bit different from JDK 9 and onwards, because in JDK 9, the library extension mechanism was deleted. Uh, so in JDK 8, you have to place it, uh, your uh, security provider in libxt, and from Java 9 and onwards, you have to place it on the class path. And also, the Java security property file that you see an example there is in a different location. So it works a little bit different in uh, until JDK 8 and from JDK 9 onwards. So, okay. So, we're not going to prove this completely now, but just to give you uh, a little bit of an uh, impression how much classes you need during your, uh, uh, your cryptographic functions, but we'll encounter them as this session continues. Okay, so today I want to cover this hashing. Symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, digital signatures, and if you have a little time left, certificates. So hashing is basically uh, taking a message and put it through this great meat grinder or whatever, and ending up with a byte string um, which has a fixed length. It's called a digest. So it has a number of interesting properties. So the first step is it's only one way. So if you would have an input string for like fox, for example, you put it through this cryptographic hash function, and out comes a byte string. Um, and uh, that is unique to that kind of input, but you cannot do it the other way around. So you cannot go back from the digest to the original input. Second one is it's deterministic. So if you put the same input through it, you will get the same digest. Third, it's fixed size. It doesn't matter how long the input is, you'll always end up with a digest of fixed length. And very important, it's pseudo-random. That means if you change only one character, for example, in this I change the V to uh, a U, um, the output is completely different. So there's no way to predict, there's no pattern in uh, the output of the digest. So that's very important in, for example, Bitcoin mining, as we'll see in a moment. Um, you might ask yourself, uh, what is the chance that two different inputs produce the same hash? Well, it's probably collision chance is something like uh, 10 to the power 13 years. So that's quite a lot. The age of the universe is a little bit less than that. So uh, the chance of a collision is very small indeed. Don't worry about this, okay? Okay, algorithms. So a few historic algorithms were called MD5 and SHA-1. These are old hash sizes. Uh, by the way, I'm not going into any math today, so if you're here for the math, you can just skip this session. Um, these are um, algorithm applications that are pretty old. Um, don't use them anymore. Uh, actually, for MD5 in 1996, um, 
some people uh, actually succeeded in creating five different PDFs all with the same hash. So collision already has taken place there. So don't use them. Use SHA-256. It has a hash size of 256 bits. And it's basically what's being used in most hashing algorithms today. So how is this done in Java? OK, so now we're getting into the classes. I will give a demo also as well, but just to get everyone on the same page. There is a class called Message Digest that you can use to, uh, there's a static metal net, and you can, it's called get instance, and you can call it what the algorithm you want. So for example, SHA-256. Then you can take your message. You can call a method called digest, and out comes the hashing. The out comes the digest or hash. So I'm going to demo that very quickly for you. So this is, is this readable? Yeah? Cool. So this is the, uh, the object I was talking about. You have a message digest. And you say get instance, and I specify the algorithm here. So um, I get a string here, an input string. And you get the bytes from that. You put it through this message digest. So message digest called digest input bytes. And you get a hash. And I will print some stuff out here so you can see what's happening. So I have these four properties. So one way only, deterministic, pseudo random, and fixed length. So if I run this, uh, where it is, yeah. You will see that, I hope this is readable. Where is it? Here. So this is one hash. And you can see it's deterministic. So the same text goes through again. It's exactly the same hash. It's pseudo-random. I changed one letter here. And the hash looks completely different. And it's also fixed length, right? So I have a lot more text here. But the hash length is still the same. So this is a demo of, uh, short demo of hash properties, OK? Um, so let's continue. So where is this used? What is an application for hashing? Now, for example, password hashing. So everyone knows you shouldn't store plain text passwords, right? Yeah. Also, probably everyone knows you shouldn't store passwords at all, right? So what you normally do is store a hash of the password. So when you create a new account, you will create a password. You put it to a hashing process on the server side, and you store the hash in your database. On the other hand, if you log in again, you provide a password. It goes through the hashing process. And we'll see in the database if the, hashing, uh, the hash actually matches with the hash just computed. Of course, you can attack this as a crypto analyst with something called a dictionary or a rainbow table. So you could just take all the English words, and you produce a hash beforehand. And you could just go through this table very quickly and see if a, uh, if a hash matches. So we have a countermeasure for that. It's called salting. So what you do is basically you add a number, uh, a, a random number of bytes. Uh, it's called a salt to uh, the password creation. You put it to the hash and you store the salt and the hash together. Similarly, if you verify the password, you can uh, take the stored salt from the database again. You calculate the uh, 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 the hash from the plain text password and the salt. And you calculate again. Now, there's no way that you can attack this by rainbow tables or dictionaries, because the hash is pseudo-random, so you have to recompute every value that you find in this stolen database anyway. So this is a good countermeasure against brute force attacks, for example. So the other one is Bitcoin block mining. So this is an um, energy consumption graph. Now, as you can see, uh, the energy consumption of Bitcoin right now is like 90% of the energy consumption of the Czech Republic. So that's quite a lot and not very environment, uh, environmentally friendly, I think. Why is this? That's because Bitcoin has a cryptographic puzzle inside its algorithm. So every time you want to create a new block in Bitcoin with a lot of transaction, there is an agreement in the specification that says the hash of a block should start with a fixed number of zeros. Now, I have an example here with four zeros, but in Bitcoin it grows and grows and grows. The number of zeros that a block now has to contain in its hash is quite a lot bigger. So what happens is I have a transaction here. Um, I will give, uh, this is a transaction of giving kudos to conferences. So for example, I love DevOps. You should really go. If you, oh, it's already sold out, by the way. So if you don't have a ticket, you're too late. Um, I give it five kudos, and I want to JFocus as well. 
Oh, sorry, I left JSpring out of here. I'm sorry, I didn't update that. Um, you give it four kudos, and now I want to create a Bitcoin block of these transactions. So what I do is I start with a random number. I will put it to a hash function, SHA-256, and I will see if it starts with four zeros. Um, this one doesn't, so what I do now is I will update this number. I will increment it by one, like this. I will calculate the hash again. Doesn't start with four zeros. Do it again. Great, now it starts with four zeros. This is a valid Bitcoin block. So, um, and of course, verification is very easy because uh, you can just take this block, calculate the hash. If it starts at four zeros, it's a valid block. Now, since there's no way to predict what the hash is going to look like, the pseudo random function, you just have to iterate over and over and over and over again. So, this takes quite a while. So, that's why um, Bitcoin block mining is just calculating hash functions all over and over again. It takes a lot of consumption, uh, it takes a lot of energy. And uh, there are better algorithms now, so for example, proof of stake, but I'm not going to talk about it. But this is an application of hashing, right? So that's hashing for you. That was the easy part. So now on to semantic encryption. So semantic encryption was uh, having one shared key um, and sharing this between, for example, two users, Bob and Alice. And uh, Bob can encrypt a message with his key, and Alice can decrypt it with the same key. So what does this look like? It looks like this. So for example, I have a plain string called uh, devox, for example. I put it through this encryption algorithm, and out comes a ciphertext. So now, there is a reason why I chose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters here. Um, that's because uh, this is a block cipher. You will see why that's important in a moment. And um, uh, oh yeah, oh, sorry. Um, the key in this case is just a sequence of bytes. So you can generate a key in Java and put it through the cipher algorithm, as you will see in a moment. So what algorithms are there? Well, there's first data encryption standard invented by IBM in 1973, I think. Um, small block size, this, this has been hacked already. So um, there was a competition in, 19, in 2001 where um, people tried to um, crack a piece of encrypted data without having the key. Uh, in 2001, it took them three months. In 2002, it took them seven days. In 2003, it took them four hours. So this is not safe anymore. Please use this one. This is uh, advanced encryption standards, uh, winner of a competition to come up with a better solution. Uh, these are um, Joh uh, Vincent Rijmen and Johan <laughs> Damen, I think. I don't know the last one anymore. But uh, these are two Belgian cryptographers, Flemish, and they came up with this encryption standard, and now it's, be, now it's being used all over the place. So how do you do this in Java? Same thing. You have a new class called Key Generator, and there is a static method on that. You can call this with the algorithm you want, for example, AES. Uh, Java supports a lot of algorithms out of the box. You generate a key. You have to put in a key size. You have a few options, 128 bytes, 192, and 256. Then you take the class cipher, you call a static instance on that. You init, initialize it with a key, and you put through your message in an um, obscure method called do final, but it basically means encrypt all this stuff. There are a few methods in between. It's called update. You can deliver your message in chunks, but uh, for this example, we just call do final, it will do the actual encryption. So. Right, there was a <laughs> piece of left animation, I don't know. Um, who's on still on Java 8 here in production? Yeah, quite, yeah, 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 me too. Um, okay, so if you're on Java 8, update uh, 152. Um, before that, probably nobody here. Uh, you had this, uh, if you put, if you started with semantic encryption, you would get this message, illegal key size, because you weren't allowed to, um, use certain key sizes outside the US. So, but that has been lifted now, so if you're on a modern version or a modern update of Java 8 or Java 9 onwards, you won't have this anymore, but this was a real problem in the past, okay? So, so I will give a demo of that. So I will start with something called electronic copybook. Um, I'll explain what it is in a moment. So 
Let's zoom in a little bit here. So you start with key generator. You give it a, uh, an algorithm. You in it with a key size, and you can call generate key to get a key. So I will print out some stuff here in a moment. I have a small text input here, DevOx. I will repeat this 16 times. You knew about this repeat method. It's new in Java 11. So uh, normally you had to do, uh, do a for loop and stuff like that. Now you have a repeat method, very handy. And um, then you get a cipher. So the cipher is the actual algorithm. So it's AES, and then something called electronic copybook. I will explain in a moment what that means. And it's something like padding, and that has to do with um, this is a block cipher. It means it encrypts and decrypts messages in chunks. So it, 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 it means that you cannot. Um, uh, the message has to be a fixed number of bytes, so times eight. So there's a little bit of, pad of padding involved in the end. And uh, I will print this, and then you pu can put the cipher in decrypt mode and get back the original text. So let's run that. So this is the input, devox, 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 devox. And here's a cipher text. Looks pretty good at first glance, you know, so uh, a little bit bigger. But can you see what's happening here? Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Exactly, there's a repeating pattern there. Why is this? Well, that's because this is called electronic copybook, and basically what it does, it encrypts messages in chunks. So if I have a message that repeats itself every eight bytes, um, you will get a ciphertext that is exactly the same every time. So, well, this might not be really a problem, but if you put a JPEG or an image, for example, through this, um, through this algorithm, you get something like this. So this is still recognizable. So this is not what you want. Um, so we have to counter a way to, uh, to fix this. So that's where cipher blockchaining comes in. So it is also somatic encryption. But now you start with a random sequence of bytes called an initialization vector. Um, you put it in the algorithm with a plain text, and out comes a cipher text. And you use the output of this text to use this as a new initialization vector for the next block. So that means if you do it like this, the block will be changed every time because there's a dependency on the last block. So if you put it like, if you put an image true, it, you, it, it will just become static. You can't recognize it anymore. Um, it looks a little bit different in Java, so you still have a key generator, but now you have also a secure random, so that's a random sequence of bytes. Out comes an IV or initialization factor parameter spec, and that's basically a, a kind of wrapper around a byte array. And you get a cipher, put both of them in, and then you get a cipher text. So if you put the algorithm in that mode, so I have here a CBC demo. So the code is basically the same as the last one, except I have a random sequence of bytes here. So this is an algorithm. I'm not going to explain it right now. Uh, but um, the, uh, the parameters both go in. So that, is, that happens here, the key and the IV spec. And in the crypt mode, the same. And if I run this, uh, you can see there's no discernible pattern anymore. So that's a way to uh, that's a way to uh, counteract uh, pattern matching or pattern recognition for crypto analysts. Yeah. So uh, demo I just gave. An application would be to, for example, a crypto wallet or zip file. So get a plain text password, you put it through an algorithm which is related to SHA-256 and somatic encryption. It's called password-based key derivation function. There is an actual demo of it in this GitLab project, so uh, at the end I will show the link and you can look at it yourself. Um, basically what this does, it converts a password into an AES key that you can then use to encrypt and decrypt your wallet. Right, so um, somatic encryption is also used in other stuff, but it's combined with asymmetric encryption and things like that. So one thing I haven't talked about is key exchange. So if you have a secret key, uh, how do you get users to uh, share this key over an unsecured channel? Well, you could put it in the diplomatic mail, for example, but that's not very useful right now. So these two guys, Martin Hellman and uh, Whitfield Diffie, came up with an algorithm brilliantly in 1976 uh, to exchange secure keys over an unsecured channel. 
So it works like this. So here are Alice and Bob again. Probably not what you expected, but... Um, so Alice and Bob each think, each agree on two numbers, and these two numbers are public. Anyone can see those, no problem. A uh, prime number and a generator of P. Then they both think of a private number that they each kept for themselves, and they put this private number through an algorithm, which is called, uh, uh, which is modulus-based. Out comes another number, which is called public. They exchange this uh, over the internet, and they put it through another uh, func uh, modulus function to calculate the shared secrets. Now, two things about this. If you do this in this way with modulus, you will always end up with a shared key on the same shared key on both sides. So that's nice. But also, there is no way for people in this yellow part, this, this public cloud part, to figure out what the private keys of Alice and Bob were. Now, of course, this is a very small, uh, uh, very small space number-wise. But you can imagine if you make this bigger, it will become impossible because basically you have lots, lots of information because of the modulus. Yeah. So this is a very nice way to um, exchange secret keys over an unsecured channel. And also, this is an example of asymmetric encryption, because you have a private and public part. So we've already seen this. Uh, asymmetric cryptography you can use uh, with, uh, you use with a key pair, so a public key and a private one. And what you encrypt with a private key can only be decoded to the public key and vice versa. So algorithms are Diffie-Hellman, we, as we've seen just, uh, just now. RSA, which is used extensively in um, handshakes, for example. And also ECC, which is elliptic curve cryptography, it's used in Bitcoin. So in Java, you have now not a key generator, but a key pair generator, because you need two keys. Um, you get a key pair, which is basically a holder for a private and a public key. Again, you go to the cipher class and you say, OK, now I want to have an asymmetric algorithm, for example, RSA. Uh, you feed it the public key. You put through your message. Out comes the cipher text. Uh, on the other hand, you initialize the cipher again with a private key. Um, you put through the cipher text and out comes your original message. So this is basically not using one shut key, but two keys. So if we run a demo of this, um, Let's see, where do I have it? Asymmetric encryption. Yeah, I hope this is readable. Now you have a key pair generator. And you initialize with a key size. It's quite a lot bigger than uh, symmetric encryption, for example. And you generate a key pair. Uh, you get an instance of the cipher. You put it in encrypt mode with a public key inside it. And then you just encrypt your text. Uh, on the other side, you can put the cipher in decrypt mode, and so again, private. Uh, you use the private key to decrypt everything, and out comes the plain text. So if I run this, uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So um, you can see that the private key and the public key are also different in length. Private keys, uh, public key is a lot shorter. That's a property of the algorithm. Um, and you can also see, okay, I, decode a, I encode a piece of text here, and out comes the original plain text at the end. And also, if I have a really big piece of text, it says data must not be longer than 170 bytes. Well, that's not really good, is it? Because how can I encrypt anything significant with this? So a property of R RSI encryption is uh, that it is not really used to encrypt large, not really suitable to encrypt large blocks of data because the key has to be like a factor eight of the original text size-wise. So that's not very handy. But you can use it for agreeing on symmetric keys, Diffie-Hellman. Um, but you can also use it for digital signatures, for example. So encrypting and decrypting symmetric keys, and you can use it for encrypting hashes or message digests. So. Um, let's look, to look at digital signatures for one moment. So encryption solves the problem of confidentiality, our problem number one, but not integrity. You don't know if the message has been tampered with. So that's where digital signatures comes in. So for example, Bob has a message. He puts it through a, a hash function, SHA-256. Out comes a hash. He sends both the message and the hash function to Alice, and then Alice calculates the hash again. So if these two hashes mesh, uh, hashes match, um, 
the message has not been tampered with. So this is a basic example of a digital signature. Now, um, you can do it in semantic encryption. It's called uh, HMAC or HMAC. I don't know the English pronunciation. Key hash message authentication code, which basically says, okay, you have a shared key, and then you uh, create something called a MAC, which is basically a hash of the message. You send them along with the message. So this, this is symmetric. But um, I'm going to skip this. But you, uh, uh, a w more well-known uh, way of doing digital signatures is through asymmetric encryption. So what basically happens is you have a message. Um, you calculate a hash. You sign it with your own private key. Um, and you send the message and the signature, which is the encrypted version of this hash, to the receiver. It will decrypt the message with a public key. The outcome's a hash, and then uh, the hash of the message will be calculated again. You compare them, and if they match up, uh, you have a valid signature. If they don't match up, the message has been tampered with. So digital signatures in Java, you can do with key pair generator. You generate a key pair again, and then you have a signature class that you can use. You init initialize it with your private key, and you sign a message. Out comes a signature. And on the other hand, on the other side, you, you put in your public key, the receiving end, you, do the mess, uh, you will uh, feed the message to the signature algorithm there, and out comes a boolean, actually. So I think that might be the last demo as well. Uh, let's see, digital signature signing demo. Yeah, that's the one. So, um, yeah. So here's a key pair generator. You initialize it with a key, and then uh, out comes a key pair. So you can now really see that this is, I have given this one before, right? So this should be JSpring, of course. Um, and then you have a signature algorithm. You say SHA-256 with RSA because it's a combined function. So it uses a hash to hash the message, and then it will encrypt it with RSA, with a private key. So you feed the algorithm your private key, you put in your input data, and you press sign, out comes the signature. So on the receiving end, you have the same algorithm. You say, I'm going to verify this with a public key that I got from the original sender. I put in the original data, and out comes a boolean. So the verify method has actually has a boolean. So if I run this, well, uh, I don't wrote any unhappy flows, so this should perfectly match up. Well. Nothing to see here much. Uh, out comes a boolean and the signature matches, right? So this is a way of guaranteeing um, uh, uh, message integrity. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, where is this used? For example, signing crypto transactions. So if, if you have bitcoins or any cryptocurrency, it doesn't matter, and you want to send something from A to B, from yourself to someone else, you will sign this transaction with your private key. And it's the same thing. So the other side that receives it, or the blockchain node in the network, can verify that this transaction is actually uh, from you because you're the owner of this private key. And they can use a public key to see if the signature is correct. So signing crypto transactions is really uh, is, is an application that heavily uses digital signatures. So last part, certificates. So we've seen confidentiality, encryption. We've seen integrity. But what about authenticity? How can I be sure? that this guy or girl on the other side says, uh, okay, I'm the owner of this private key, how do I know? So that's where our certificates come in, right? So a certificate is basically a written statement from a trusted provider that says, okay, I have checked that this person is actually who he or she thinks he is, and this private key belongs to them, and this her, his or her public key also belongs to him or her, and I will vouch for this. So this is what a certificate provider does. So how do you get such a certificate? Well, it's really easy. You generate a public or private key with Java, as I've sh just shown you, and you send to this provider a certificate signing request. So you can do this automatically. It's in the Java API. Uh, and it basically contains uh, your uh, public key, because you will never give out your private key, right? Uh, along with some basic information about yourself and uh, identification, uh, this certificate of authority will check that it's actually you, just through analog means, and it will give you a certificate back signed by their private key, 
saying that you actually are who you say you are. And of course, uh, their public key is on that certificate, so you can check that they actually are who they say they are. So you can guess where I'm going here. So you can repeat this a number of times. So a certificate provider also has to prove who or uh, that, that he is who he is. But this ends somewhere, right? So these are root certificates and root certificate providers, for example, Google or VeriSign, um, that we explicitly trust because, well, they're just to be trusted, you know? So, of course, you can imagine what happens uh, if this goes wrong. And we did. So in the Netherlands, we had this company. Um, so you're not from DigiNauta, are you? No, okay. <laughs> Um, we had this company in 2007, uh, Digital which, which was a, a root certificate authority, and um, uh, someone managed to hack into the infrastructure and their private keys were stolen. So that basically means all certificates that this certificate provider provided to other people, and either intermediate stuff, so you get a whole umbrella of certificates, were not to be trusted anymore, and everybody had to update their certificates, including Rabobank, where I, I work. So, of course, nobody trusted this company anymore. I don't know exactly of if it was entirely their fault or not. Uh, I've not read into the details too much. But nobody explicitly trusted them anymore, and they went bankrupt in the same year. So, yeah, that was an, uh, an example of how fragile this certificate structure can be. So. Um, last part, um, you have private keys, public keys, and certificates, and you have to store them somewhere, right? So, um, people probably recognize this, so you have a API in the Java API that's called Key Store, and you can use this to store key and certificate material. You can load something from an input stream, you can get and put keys in there, you can get and put certificates in there, uh, you have a number of types, so JKS was the default, now it's uh, PKCS12, which is an industry standard. And uh, JKS also hadn't, didn't have the ability to store symmetric keys, only asymmetric keys. But JCAKS has, and PKCS12 has as well. So, um, you can do this programmatically, so you can write a Java program and just go and load your keys in, but it's easier to use this tool, right? Key tool. So it's included in the JDK, and you can just use it to generate key pairs, um, generate certificate requests, and importing and exporting certificates. So um, if you want to do it programmatically, um, you can, but um, the SunJC provider is a little bit tricky, so you, you should bouncy castle for stuff like that. Um, but just use this tool, and you'll be pretty happy, I'm sure. So that was the last part. So there's one thing more to show you. So all these things come together in uh, one specific protocol you use probably every day. You can guess what it is? Yes, HTTPS. So um, the HTTPS handshake is quite complicated, but all these things I talked to you about come together in this handshake. So I'll show you this very shortly. So the first part, what happens is that the client says a uh, hello to the server, and it will tell the server, okay, I support these two, these key exchange algorithms. So for example, Diffie-Hellman is still in there, or RSA, for example. So the server will send its certificates to the clients. The client will verify this certificate by checking its digital signature. Then um, a giant thinks of a random number, it will encrypt it with a public key that is contained in the certificate of the server, it will send it back to the server. The server will decrypt this uh, number um, with um, its private key, because it has its private key, and now they share this same number uh, without anybody knowing. So they use this number, basically, they put it to an algorithm to generate a symmetric key, AES, and then you have AES encryption on both sides, and the actual data stream is encrypted using semantic encryption, so not asymmetric encryption. So this is an example of all these things I talked to you about come together in HTTPS, okay? So um, that was my talk for today. I, my goal was to um, explain some basic understanding of cryptography, 
uh, cryptographic concepts and how they're done in Java. Um, so thank you very much. If you want to play with this stuff, there's a GitHub, GitLab project, uh, sorry, GitHub project on here, which contains these demos and a lot more. And um, yeah, that's it for me. So I guess it's beer time now. So thanks very much. Uh, please rate this session. And I hope you had a very enjoying conference. Thank you very much.